Hello everyone, welcome to the second lecture of Advanced Calculus. Uh, in the second lecture, as mentioned in the uh, previous of mathematical induction. We will learn what mathematical induction is, and <clears throat> we will try to prove the mathematical mathematical induction with the axiom we have learned in the previous lecture. And if time allows, we will try to learn the second axiom of real numbers, which is the most important axiom of real numbers, the completeness of real numbers. And uh, if we have more time left, then we will try to prove the fact that the set of all natural numbers is actually unbounded. So our first topic today will be the concept of mathematical induction. So what is mathematical induction? Mathematical induction is a method of proof in mathematics. Um, so for example, let's say there is a statement about all natural numbers n. So, um, so if the statement goes like this, for all natural number n. Uh, this notation is, as used in the previous lecture, is the uh, notation n in uh, set theory. So n is in uh, the set of all natural numbers. So n is a element of, of the set of the all natural numbers. So for all n in natural numbers, blah, blah, blah. So for these kind of <coughs> statements, we use the uh, proof method of mathematical induction to prove it. So what is mathematical induction? So first, to prove this statement is true, we first prove that this statement is true for n equals 1. And we prove that for every natural number n, uh, if, the state, if this statement holds for any natural number n, then we prove that it holds for the next natural number too. So in, math, in the method of mathematical induction, we try to prove these two points. So, and if we prove these two points, then we're proving that the statement holds for all natural numbers. So how is this possible? So we first prove that, so there's the set of all natural numbers we should go like one, two, three, four, and so on. Um, we first prove that the the given statement is uh, true for the first natural number, which is one. And if we prove that for any natural number k, if the statement holds for for that k, then the statement holds for the next next number of k, k plus one. Then we're proving that um, from the first from the first part of the proof, uh, we prove that it's the same it holds for one, and by the second part, we prove that <coughs> it holds for two, and for three, because two holds, and for four, and so on, and for all natural numbers. So, in other words, we could say that the mathematical induction is a, the mathematical induction is equivalent to the following statement. For a subset B of the set of natural numbers, if 1 is an element of B, if n is an element of B, then n plus 1 is the element of B, then then b is equal to the set of all natural numbers. So mathematical induction is in mathematical notation is this concept. So we need to prove that if these two conditions hold, then, then, the, uh, then the set we're talking about, this set actually, um, by this mechanism, it covers all natural numbers. So we're proving, we're proving that, that point of this whole method. So we want to see if if a subset B of natural numbers n holds 
holds these two conditions, then it equals to uh, it equals to the set of optimal natural numbers. So, for in this case, we could use this statement. Let's say this statement is um, P n. If B is a set a subset of natural numbers that 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 the statement holds then this statement is exactly saying what we have discussed before so let us try to prove this this statement using the first axiom we have learned in the previous lecture let us first erase all this part We need a larger eraser, right? Okay, let's use this space for our proof. For this proof, we will use the method of uh, method of proof by contradiction. So we will first uh, assume the negative of our conclusion. And start starting from this conclusion, we will uh, logically deduce the following the following uh, logical deductions, and we will show that using consistent logic, we will uh, this assumption leads to a contradiction. So, which will mean that the first assumption will be wrong, and that our original conclusion is right. So, to use that method we'll first assume the negative of a conclusion. So let's say that a subset B of natural number N, uh, of the set of all natural numbers, the following conditions hold. First, that 1 is an element of B, and if N is an element of B, then N plus 1 is an element of B. And let us say that B is actually not equal to the set of all natural numbers. Then we could think of a set A. The set of A is the uh, rest of the natural numbers that are not in N. And since B is not equal to the set of all natural numbers, A would not be an empty set, right? It should contain an element. Because if A is an empty set, that will mean that B is actually equal to the set of all natural numbers which is contrary to our assumption. So A is not a empty set. And by our first axiom of real numbers, there would exist an element minimum of A. Remember, if A is a subset of natural numbers, which, is, which it is, and it is not an empty set, then it contains a minimum element. That was our first axiom of real numbers. So let's say that this minimum is small n. And by our assumption, the first assumption that 1 is an element of B, uh, 1 could not be an element of A, since A is a partition of natural number n with B. So since 1 is an element of B, A should not contain n. Uh, A should not contain 1. So n cannot be equal to 1, correct? Then, since n is not equal to 1, n minus 1 is also a natural number. Because n is not equal to 1, n minus 1 should be a natural number. And, and let's say that for this small n minus 1, assume that small n minus 1 isn't actually a element of B. Then what happens? Since n minus 1 is element of B, by the second assumption, n should be also an element of B, which is a contradiction because n is a, n is a minimum of set A, so by the definition of minimum, it should be an element of A, and if n is an element of A, n cannot be an element of B simultaneously. So this assumption is wrong, which implies that n minus 1 is also an element of A. Now the game is over. The since n minus one is an element of A, 
and n is a minimum of a, the following relationship should hold. m minus 1 should be less, uh, should be greater than or equal to minimum of a, which is n. And that implies 0 is greater than 1, which is an obvious contradiction. So our logic until here was uh, was without error. It was uh, flawless. So if our conclusion is a contradiction, then we could deduce that our initial assumption was wrong, which implies that B was actually a set equal to the set of all natural numbers. So we have proven the mathematical induction. Mathematical induction is proven. Now, let us learn about the second axiom of real numbers. And before, before we talk about the second axiom of real numbers, we should uh, learn about a concept called infimum and supremum. So our topic is the second axiom, which is completeness of real numbers. This is the second and the most important axiom we will use through, uh, during this course. So completeness of real numbers means that for a non-empty subset of real numbers, And if the set is bounded below, we, we learned about the uh, concept of bounded below in the previous lecture, right? If A is bounded below, then there exists, exists a real number U such that first, u is a lower bound of a and for any lower bound of a the that lower bound is smaller than uh, less than or equal to u so u is a maximum is the uh, is the greatest lower bound of a so it is really similar to the concept of minimum we have learned. So let's say that here is a subset A of natural number A, uh, uh, of all real numbers, and U. U is a lower bound of A such that for all lower bounds possible for set A, then they are all less than or equal to U. So this is a very similar concept to minimum. And we call this uh, call this real number the infimum of set A, and the and that and the axiom of completeness of real numbers states that for any non-empty subset of real numbers that is bounded below, there exists this infimum. So that is the second axiom of the real numbers. So we can approve this. We just accept this as a truth. And very obviously, if u is a minimum of a, then it should be the infimum of a. So we could observe that infimum is actually a more generalized concept of minimum. So observe that u does not have to be an element of set a, whereas the minimum should, should be the element of set a. So this is a more generalized concept of minimum. And the axiom itself is pretty clear. And just like we have done with minimum, you could prove that if an infimum of set A exists, then it is actually unique. And the proof, go, proof will go similar. So try to do this as an exercise. Uh, and consult the previous lecture if it is pretty difficult. The proof is actually very similar to the proof that minimum 
of a set is unique if it exists. So let's uh, let's check that let's check the statement that infimum is a uh, more generalized concept of minimum. So consider this set: an interval from zero to one that does not include zero and includes one. So remember that you should uh, you remember that the minimum of this set did not exist, but actually we could easily check that and infimum of this set exists and it is zero. So try to prove this one. It is the proof is actually quite easy. So what you have to check is that zero is a lower bound of the given set which is pretty obvious because for any element in the set it should be greater than or equal to zero and second if there is a lower bound for this set you should check that that lower bound is always less than or equal to zero so you could easily check these two points and you will check that the infimum of this set exists. So, in fact, infimum of A exists for uh, uh, infimum exists for sets that do not have minimum. So this is a more generalized concept. So the proof is quite easy. Try to do this as an exercise. And we will, uh, I will introduce a similar concept, actually an analog analogous concept called supremum. So supremum of B, what does this notation mean? Supremum is uh, exactly the uh, opposite of infimum. So if there's a minimum and maximum, then there's an infimum and supremum. So you could actually define supremum of B by yourself, uh, which is uh, very analogous to the definition of infimum. So for a, a non-empty subset of uh, all real numbers that is bounded above, in this case it should be bounded above, then there exists, there exists, uh, we will. Uh, we could use this notation like this. There exists v such that first v should be an upper bound of b, and second, for any upper bound of b, the that upper bound is greater than or equal to v. So it's very analogous to the concept of infimum. It it is actually symmetrically defined. So uh, the supremum of B is a concept of the least upper bound, if you want to say. So the completeness, the axiom of completeness of all, uh, completeness of real numbers states that for a non-empty subset of real numbers that is bounded above or below, there exists supremum. or infimum. And that is the uh, concept of completeness of real numbers. So using this axiom, let's try to prove as a finale of this lecture, let's try to prove that the set of all natural numbers is actually unbounded. This will be the first statement that we will use our second axiom, the completeness of real numbers, to prove the theorem we want to prove. So, all natural numbers is unbounded. The proof is quite easy. Proof. Let us say that, so again, we'll using, we are using the proof by contradiction method. So, if n is bounded, above C 
since a natural numbers is obviously a non-empty subset of real numbers, by the completeness of real numbers, since and it, uh, then since a set of natural numbers is bounded above, there exists a number b, a uh, number v, the supremum of this set. Correct. So there exists a supremum of, um, of the set of all natural numbers, and since this is a supremum for all. This inverse A notation is the uh, notation for for all. So for all n, it, an element of natural numbers. So for all natural numbers, the following inequality holds by the definition of supremum. So V, since it is a supremum of the set of all natural numbers, it is greater than greater than or equal to all natural numbers. But since if a n is a uh, n is a natural number then observe that n plus 1 is also a natural number 2 so since this inequality f holds for any natural number n the following inequality should also hold for any natural number n correct since n plus 1 is also a natural number so this means that n for any natural number is actually less than or equal to v minus 1. And since this holds for any natural number n, since we started from any natural number n, and v is a supremum of n, since uh, v is a the least upper bound of these uh, set of all natural numbers, and v minus 1, as you can see, is another uh, upper bound of the set of all natural numbers. So, by the definition of supremum, the following inequality should hold. This is the second second assumption, correct? Uh, second uh, second part of the definition of supremum, correct? So, since since v minus one is another upper bound of the set of all natural numbers, the and v is a supremum, the following inequality should hold, which is, again, 1 is less than or equal to 0, which is a contradiction. And why did this contradiction occur? Because we have started from the wrong assumption, which means that the set of all natural numbers is not bounded above, implying that it is unbounded. So we have proved proven that the set of all natural numbers is unbounded and we'll actually use this uh, fact quite often and usefully. So this is the end of the second lecture and for the next lecture we will learn the concept of convergence. We'll learn what convergence means in advanced calculus and we'll try to deal a few of its characteristics in the next lecture. Uh, thank you for listening to the second lecture, and see you at the next lecture.